Schools run a marathon. Not too many. When you get to the halfway point, it's a good thing. We're at the halfway point of the Believe series. Amen? It's been good so far. Um, not only, you know, there's three parts, and each, each part has ten messages, and we're in the second part, and we're halfway through the second part. The first half, let me see if I can get all this straight, the first half of the second part has all been dealing with our vertical relationship with, with God. Now we're going to be transitioning into our horizontal relationship with others. It's really neat when we think about the vertical and the horizontal. Whenever we see the cross that Jesus died on, that's what we can think of. Our vertical relationship with God and our horizontal relationship with others. So, what is the series big idea? Here it is. Being disciplined like Jesus is how I am becoming like Jesus. So we look at Jesus as our model, as our, our guide in how we become like Jesus. Um, interestingly, Jesus, when he was uh, walking on the earth, um, was, he was just tested all the time, wasn't he? The, the, uh, the Pharisees were trying to trick him up, and one time they came and asked him the question, well, you know, Jesus, what's the, what's the most important commandment? Guess what? They knew the answer. They were just trying to trick him up. But Jesus replied with the correct answer. And here it is out of Matthew 22. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, we get that vertical, love God, and we get that horizontal, love neighbor. So biblical community is both vertical and horizontal. It's between God and us and between us and others. So the fill in the blank is simple. I obey Jesus by loving God and loving my neighbor. Remember one time when Jesus was kind of sharing this, he, he got asked a follow-on question. Who's my neighbor? Now, I'm not going to share the story of the Good Samaritan, but you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But I'm going to ask the same question of you. Who is your neighbor? Who is our neighbor these days in this technical, technological age? How many are on Facebook? I want to see those hands. All, you know, raise the, look around. You're not alone. You know that there are people, I don't know, I hope you're not one of them, that actually think that you know everything there is to know about other people by what they share on Facebook. It's not true. <laughs> okay? Uh, people share what they want to share on Facebook. I've got the people that are dear to me that rant and rave <laughs> on Facebook and and yes, they are related to me. <laughs> and I say, oh my goodness gracious, what have they done now? Um, there are people that think they have relationships with people on Facebook that they've never even met. Uh, I, I mean, literally, uh, there is a woman who kind of shared stuff about how to be a good mom. And I mean, what she put out was really good stuff. I mean, excellent stuff and she got all these followers and all these likes and people were loving her and and well it turns out that she got sick and required hospitalization and she posted that on Facebook people sent her money for her hospitalization she gathered about like a hundred thousand dollars and so, someone said oh there was a news people that said and interviewed and said why did you give money to this person that you don't even know? And the response was this, I do know her. Not really. In fact, they interviewed the family of the woman and said, no, the, she's, she's, she's got problems. <laughs> she just shares the good stuff. And that's often what we do on Facebook. Um, and so in this age of technological wonder... Um, Facebook is probably not the place for true and honest intimacy. 
Now, I've got a question for you. When Jesus was sharing these words, he was responding back to the Pharisees, right? That's a given. But who was with him? His disciples. Let us remember that Jesus himself was the first one to establish a Jesus-centered biblical community. He went through the process of inviting his disciples. And then what did he do with this Jesus-centered community? Wouldn't that have been amazing? Talk about a biblical community. The disciples had it, man. They, they were with, with the first Jesus-centered community that modeled the, the community for everyone else. Well, he spent time with them. Uh, he ate with them. Uh, the disciples observed him and everything that he did they went out and served others. Remember, the, what did the disciples do? They, they first of all, like when the, on the mountainside that, uh, where there were 5,000 gathered, uh, they found out that there was only like some little bit of fish and bread, and Jesus did his thing, and the miracle happened, and everyone ate. And what did the disciples do afterwards? They went out and gathered 12 basketfuls of fish and bread left over. Amazing. They were, the disciples were serving others. And dare I say that Jesus just hung out with his disciples. You know, if Jesus had been here with his disciples last weekend, he was probably in front of the TV watching that boring Super Bowl game. Uh, the real Super Bowl was three weeks ago. Anyway, I, I, I digress. Um, and so, let us remember that as we consider biblical community, it's Jesus himself that established the first one in being a Jesus-centered community with his disciples. And so let's just take a look at a few things. First of all, some verses from Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25 says this, and let us consider, let's just pause just a moment. Let us consider. Is that a good thing? To, to pause and to ponder? Yeah. I dare say that we probably don't do enough of it. Uh, sometimes we just get, you know, we're just in reactive mode so much. Oh, let's just do it. Or something happens to us and we make a quick decision. And, and sometimes we just need to step back, pray, vertical relationship, and ponder. Say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Uh, when do I really need to make this decision? And take our time. Sometimes we need to make a fairly quick decision, but almost always we have time to pray and ask God's direction. So let us consider, and then it can, continues on, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching, you see, all the more as you see the day approaching, that's all about the motivation of doing what we're talking about here. Is Jesus coming back again? The words of the New Testament are very clear. Jesus is coming again. Are we one day closer today to Him coming again? Yeah. And in fact... We probably need to live our lives like he's coming again today with that anticipation. It gives us a motivation to realize that we're not living in the temporary. We're living in the eternal, and we should be living with the idea that Jesus is with us and will be with us in the flesh soon. Will it be before or after your death? Don't know, but it could be today. And so... Recognize that motivation. So let's, uh, look, look, just looking at that verse again, it says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It's kind of an interesting negative here. He's saying, don't let not meeting become a habit. Instead, the implication is, let meeting together be the habit. When are we talking about discipline? and being discipled. We're talking about habits. Habits are so important. We don't, we don't just do a habit occasionally. We do a habit frequently. 
We do it over and over again. It's, it's something that we always do. In other words, I don't know if you've ever been a part of a small group where people come uh, once every six, seven, eight weeks, they're there. I mean, it takes a commitment to really develop the habit of meeting together. And so I encourage you, when you commit to being a part of a small group, when you commit to being a part of a community group, when you commit to being a part of this place, commit. See what happens when you actually make it a habit of regularly being a part of a community. It's a discipline, and don't uh, let's, you know, just remember the root word of disciple is discipline, of having habits in our lives. Now, secondly, it's mentioned in that verse is that we encourage one another. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but just for now, just re- recognize there's a mutuality here. We help each other, and together we are stronger. So the fill in the blank is this. When I meet with others, they can encourage me, and I can encourage them. What you have to share with me is important, and perhaps what I have to share with you is also important. So it's, we work together. I want to also share a couple of ver- uh, more verses here. First of all, out of Acts 2, that's the most important verse, the key verses, uh, according to the Belief book. So I felt like it needed to be part of this message. So every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Uh, There's a lot there in these verses, but I just want to focus in on the fact of where they met. They met in the temple courts, the large gathering, kind of like our Sunday gatherings, and they met in their homes, two different places. Now, let's just face it. uh, Sometimes I really hope that our Sunday gatherings are an encouragement, a place to grow. But let's also be honest. You can get in and out of here without forming a deep relationship. You can sneak in and you can sneak out. In a sense, you can kind of check the box with God on your own terms. Ooh. You can hide from people because let's face it, yeah, people, uh, yeah, I'm one, you're one, but people can hurt you. They can disappoint you. Meeting in our homes, on the other hand, ooh, it's more likely that you might be just be challenged to be in a place of intimacy, a place of accountability, a place for transparency. The ladies were challenged with wearing masks. Being in our homes, we're challenged to take the masks off so that people see us for who we are. One other thing that I want to share, and this time out of 1 Corinthians 16, and this is at the end of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians that we have recorded. There were probably two or three, uh, you know, a few more. But um, at the end, he he shares this, and he says, in Oh, excuse me, the churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Achilla and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets in their home. You know what's kind of cool about this verse? This was written 25 years after that verse in Acts chapter 2, where they were meeting in homes. So 25 years later, they're still meeting in homes. The home meeting place has been replicated from Jerusalem to wherever the church and Christianity grew. I don't know if you knew this, but it wasn't until over 200 years after this event, recorded in Corinthians, that the first building that was solely dedicated for gathering Christians together was built. 
the first church building. Until then, the first several centuries of Christian life was all about meeting in homes. The, get, the larger gathering was more challenging. And so, here's the fill in the blank. God's plan from the beginning of the church was that it would meet in homes as well as in larger gatherings. Why? Because biblical community can take place. Now, there's risks. There's risks associated with meeting in homes. I already kind of alluded to them. And we're going to be talking about that this morning. But the, the risk is... Man, people may judge me. And let's be honest, it, it requires time and commitment to have meetings on a weekly basis in our homes. It involves inviting people and talking to people. And sometimes we just don't like people. <laughs> Sometimes we need to learn just to ask questions and say, hey, Jeff, how, how's your week been? And, you know, tell me about your job. And, you know, what do you do in your spare time? And just ask questions and listen and invite people. And it's oftentimes that we have to invite people a whole, whole bunch of times. The, the, our challenge is sometimes we'll invite people and say, and they say, well, I might be there. And we get our hopes up and we get excited and they, oh, hey, they might be here. And then they don't show up. <laughs> and we invite them again and they say, well, I might be there. And we get excited again and then they don't show up. And then we just give up. You know that statistically it takes about 12 or 13 no's until people actually come to an invitation like what we're talking about? We just give up because we don't like the maybe that turns into a no, or we don't just like the no. I don't, know, I don't think so. I want to encourage you, embrace the no's because you'll get to the yes. Are people important? You betcha. They're important. And that's this, uh, this is going to be a theme this morning, but... People, including you, are going to be asking, is this a safe place to be? Safe to engage? Will they be judged? But we, as we think about this, we just need to realize that all people have a brokenness to them. And the world is broken. We live in a sinful world. We all have issues. And so you're not alone and the people that you invite have issues just like you do. So, key question is this. How? How do I do it? How do I develop healthy relationships with others? I'm going to be sharing several fill-in-the-blanks here that are keyed off of key verses that are, I call the one-another verses. There's probably over 40 one-another verses we're not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to share some. The first one is this, be devoted to and honor one another. This is out of Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. In other words, it's getting beyond ourselves. We, being devoted is all about saying, hey, someone else is really, really important. Stop worrying about whether others will like us or dare I say be bored with us. Being devoted is, is a, a genuine care and a commitment towards another person so that we get beyond whether we think they might be di disapproving of our past mistakes. We're learning how to be transparent. So we'll take risks in order to care about someone else. That's what devotion is. Honoring, honoring is really all about placing a high value on someone else it's uh, it's like when they walk into a room and oh, they're here and we just say we want to honor them and and there's there's this this amazing thing that happens when people feel honored 
say, wow, I, the value that I feel, I want to come back. So we honor each other. And that takes a commitment and a sense of uh, an intentionality that says, hey, I really want to make sure that this person who's coming into my home feels valued. Or it's when you go into someone else's home that you go in and make the host feel valued. All right, continuing on. The next fill in the blank is accept one another. And that's out of Romans 15, 7. It says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. The foundation of this acceptance is on the fact that Jesus Christ has accepted you. You know, see, who are you? If we really understand who we are, we, we're all in the same boat. We're, we're sinners that need a Savior. And Jesus Christ has accepted you in spite of your sin. And so he, that's the whole reason why he died on the cross was to take care of our sin problem. And so he accepts you. He looks at you and says, I love you. I accept you. And therefore, when we look at other people, we can do the same thing. We can accept people because they're just sinners just like we are. They need a Savior just like we need a Savior. And so we accept people. So we are able to have our, share our true feelings. We, we're able to avoid the three fears that cause us to be inauthentic. And that's the fear of exposure, the fear of rejection, the fear of being hurt again. And let's just face it, most of us have been hurt by other people. And we don't want to go through that again. And yet, we need to get over that fear because Jesus has accepted us. We want to accept others to let them know that they don't have to have that fear. Regardless of what they've been through, we can accept them. The next one is instruct one another. Verse in Romans 15, verse 14 says, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sister, sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. There are experiences that I have gone through that you have not gone through. There are experiences that you have gone through that I have not experienced. Therefore, what you have to share from your feelings and your experiences, I may just need to hear. And what I've gone through could contribute to something to allow you to go through life in a better way. So we are able to instruct each other. Also, quite honestly, just think about it. The Holy Spirit that's in me is in you too. As we are reading God's Word, the Holy Spirit could be saying something to you that He's not saying to me, but if He's saying something to me that He's not saying to you. We need to share and collaborate and learn everything we can through the Holy Spirit. And it takes your words and my words to contribute to the whole. Why do we have four Gospels, for goodness sakes? Couldn't He have just done it in one? No. We've got four Gospels because there are four perspectives. And when people get together, we're all bringing our perspectives together. And they contribute to how we can live life the best. Next one, it says, serve one another. You, my and this is out of Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Wow. The uh, humbly in love part. For, you know, there's that love chapter where we have a wonderful description of what love is all about. You know, not keeping record of wrongs and it's kind and all these things. It's a challenge at times. But humbly in love, we're to serve each other. And in order to do that, I dare say we have to listen. Remember the bless strategy that we've shared before? We begin with prayer. We listen. We eat together. We serve each other. And finally, we get to share our story with other people. It's a wonderful strategy, but serving is a critical part 
of this. And this is going to be reinforced in some other verses as well. So listen for opportunities to serve others. You know, your car breaks down. Someone else's car breaks down. And you're a mechanic and you've got the the correct tools to be able to help. Or maybe you come into a windfall and you've got some extra money that you can share. But you serve each other. This next one is related. Carry the burdens of one another. Galatians 6 2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. We each have our own burdens. You know, even this morning, I was uh, talking with uh, someone who comes to the 815 service, and I was reminded that they had their oldest son passed away just four years ago uh, when he was like 40 years old. And I was just reminded, uh, even as I've shared my own story of how I lost my daughter six years ago, and there was a, a burden sharing that took place this morning before the 815 service. And we bear each other's burdens just by being transparent, by taking our masks off. And there's some hurt that gets shared and lessened as a result. The next thing is that we, I'll I'll share the story after I share the fill in the blank. It's be patient with one another. And Ephesians 4, 2 says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Whoa, I initially had the words put up with. (laughs) And let's be honest, sometimes there's those people that are just a little creepy. (laughs) And we, uh, we don't want to be with them. But God is saying, hey, be patient with them. Maybe to someone else, you're a little creepy. <laughs> and they're being patient with you. I also want to bring out the whole idea of confidentiality. It's, it's kind of associated with this whole, di- whole idea of patience. When people share things in our groups, there's a commitment to, being, to having confidentiality. Nothing will destroy a group faster than when that, that confidentiality is destroyed. And so our prayer requests don't become our gossip. It just, that will destroy the intimacy. And so, enough said. <laughs> let's move on submit to one another is the next one I love this verse Ephesians, Ephesians verse five, uh, chapter 5 verse 21 uh, a lot of what I share in marriage counseling is based upon this verse submit to one another out of reverence for Christ the submit word in this the original language that the New Testament was written in was Greek it's in the middle voice. And, uh, and so the middle voice means that it comes from within you. It can't be demanded from someone else. So you can't use this verse in the one that comes next. You've got to submit to me because the Bible says so. No. It cannot be demanded. Submission comes from within. It's a voluntary laying our own thoughts and wants and dreams and ambitions to the side so that we can focus in on someone else. And why do we do that? Because we revere Jesus. We have an honor for Him. I don't know if you've ever seen the marriage triangle, but this is really what it's all about. But it applies to all of our relationships, even the relationships in biblical community. Why are we doing what we do? We submit to each other, so, and we do it because Jesus is involved. Jesus, therefore, becomes our unity. If we get this verse, we are unified because we love Jesus, we revere Jesus, and we agree on that first and foremost and foundationally. So, he's the basis of our unity. One last fill in the blank before moving on to other things. And this is kind of returning to what we talked about earlier. Encourage one another. 
There in 1 Thessalonians it says, Therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. It makes each other stronger. We focus on building up, not on tearing down. We help those who are weak. Because we may be the weak ones next week. Wow, that's a play on words. There's a mutual accountability also. In other words, you want to get a prayer partner. You, you want to say, hey, how can I encourage this one or two other people? And you text them during the week and say, how are you doing today? I'm thinking of you. How are things? How are things? I'm praying for you. And, and so there's an ongoing communication process. You check up on another person. I believe that Jesus kind of summarized all of this in one new command that we find in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. And the, the verse goes like this. It says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So, there's real benefits of being in a biblical community. We're not perfect, but we're real. Even Jesus experienced the imperfections of people in his first disciples. Peter denied them. Was Jesus disappointed? Yeah. But he knew people. When we deal with people, we're going to be disappointed. But we love them anyway. We choose to be transparent anyway. So, so face-to-face means that things aren't airbrushed. We see the warts and the blemishes and everything, and we realize that we're all imperfect. And so the teaching big idea is this. I become more like Jesus when I have loving relationships in a Jesus centered community just like jesus established the first jesus centered community with his disciples he wants us to be involved in the same way there's a song that was written a few decades ago i'm gonna you know embrace my gray hair the words are good it wasn't until just this past week or so that I f- discovered that a Christian group called DC Talk actually put it to a hip-hop sound. But here's the words to lean on me. Just listen. Sometimes in our lives, we all have pain. We all have sorrow. But if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. Please swallow your pride. If I have things you need to borrow, for no one can fill those of your needs that you won't let show. You just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need someone to lean on. I might just have a problem that you'll understand. We all need someone, somebody to lean on. Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on, for it won't be long Till I'm going to need somebody to lean on. You just call me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. You see, biblical community is a place where we can all learn to lean on others and allow others to lean on us. The neat thing is if we get this, something else happens as a result. When we look at those verses out of John 13, it says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So being in community impacts others where I work, live, and play. Wow. You see, when we're committed to living in a Jesus-centered community, people around us are watching We're sharing Jesus, and we don't even know it. It's happening. And the kingdom of God is growing as a result. Wow. I invite you. 
I could, I could do it 12 or 13, 13 times real quick. But no, I, I just want to invite you. Be a part of a Jesus-centered community. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you and I thank you that we can be challenged that if we're not already, that we need to be a part of a community. And it, it takes a commitment. It takes trusting in you that people, even if they hurt us, that we're okay. Because we can model being accepted by you to others. So Lord God, allow us to make that step, to take that next step of being a part of a biblical community. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There will be prayer partners up front. God bless you, Westside.